Assalamu alaikum, my name is Afifa Khawaja and welcome to Muslim Perspectives, a weekly program dedicated to bringing you news about the Muslim community, both at the international and local levels. On today's program, we'll be discussing the significance of Masjid al-Aqsa, which is the first Qibla of the Muslims. We have on our program Brother Zafar Bangish, who will be discussing why this issue of the liberation of Palestine and Masjid al-Aqsa are so crucial for Muslims today. Brother Zafar, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Could you please share with us what the significance of Masjid al-Aqsa is and why it should matter to Muslims at all? Well, um, Masjid al-Aqsa um, was the first Qibla of the Muslims. Uh, it's mentioned in the Quran in many uh, verses uh, and most particularly the beginning or opening verse of uh, Surah Al-Isra or Surah Bani Israel as it's also called in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, he transported the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa from Masjid Al-Haram at night and instantly transported him to Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, whose precincts, or whose environment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed. Uh, the ayat says, Barakna hawlahu. That means that Allah has blessed its environment. The, that means the whole of Palestine is actually uh, holy land. And uh, when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was brought to Masjid al-Aqsa, over there, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had assembled all of the previous prophets, every, every one of them starting from Adam alayhi salam up to Isa alayhi salam, a total of about 124,000 prophets uh, according to a hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam led them in prayers. What this indicates is that he was formally given the leadership of all of the prophets. It was well known throughout uh, history, but here was a practical manifestation of that leadership of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he led all the other prophets in prayer before he ascended to heaven to Sidratul Muntaha. So, Masjid Al-Aqsa, because it was the first Qibla of the Muslims, number two, that that's the place where the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led all of the other Anbiya in prayers and therefore got the leadership of the Anbiya. That's where he went on his mirage from and the fact that Muslims are the only ones that are the true custodians of Masjid al-Aqsa and of all the holy places of the other faith communities because as Muslims no matter how vilified we may be but we can challenge anybody to show us or tell us whether throughout history we have indulged in the kind of vandalism and destruction of other people's religious places as many people of other faiths have done so in contemporary history. How they have desecrated, you know, they have blown up mosques and they have killed innocent Muslims. Muslims don't do things like that. Of course, there are people uh, totally, you know, outside uh, the, the teachings of Islam who do things like that, but the overwhelming majority of Muslims condemn them. Muslims have not desecrated other people's places of worship uh, as an official policy. We can't do it because as Muslims we are commanded by Allah to respect other people's religious places and to protect them rather than destroy them. So Muslims are the only ones that can be the true custodians of Masjid al-Aqsa and thereby providing uh, protection to other faith communities as well. And the fact that it is our first Qibla, we cannot let go of it and let other people take control of it and destroy it for us because obviously that would be a desecration of a very, very sacred place in Islam. But we hear often that Palestine and Jerusalem was, or were rather, promised to the Jewish people. Is this not the case? Yes and no. Uh, I think there is uh, a lot of uh, misconception about uh, this uh, issue and of course um, the Zionists uh, 
peddle this myth vociferously. Let me explain uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to them, to the Jewish people. Uh, they were promised uh, Palestine, as the Holy Land as it's called, in fact at the time of Musa alayhi salam, and they were told to go into Palestine, but they refused. They refused to go, and they in fact told Musa alayhi salam that you go to, to Palestine because there are people that are very powerful and we cannot face them. You go, you go with your brother. Of course, his brother was Harun alayhi salam, another prophet. And so as a result of their rejection of Allah's command, they were condemned to wander in the desert for 40 years. And Allah told them that this land is promised to you so long as you accept Allah's covenant. Not without Allah's covenant. You cannot have Allah's promise when you violate his covenant. So the Zionists are in complete violation of the covenant of Allah, number one. Secondly, there are Orthodox Jewish people that say that we cannot enter Palestine or Jerusalem and we have to wait until the Messiah returns and he will lead us into Palestine. But he would not do it riding a tank or with blazing guns. He would be the Messiah, the man of God, who would do it peacefully. And so what we see is that the Zionists who incidentally, uh, many of them don't even believe in God and yet they insist that God promised them that land. I mean, this is absurd. You know, they even distort the teachings of the Torah. So, Allah's covenant extends only to those people who accept Allah's covenant and Allah's promise extends to those that accept Allah's covenant. And number two, they cannot distort the words of Allah. They have to abide by the truth that is revealed in the Torah, not distort it. And if these Zionists are really uh, truthful about what the Torah says, then they would be like the Orthodox Jewish people that say that, no, we cannot enter Palestine by force. We cannot go and kill people. We will enter there peacefully. But finally, I think what is important to bear in mind is that Muslims, as the recipients of the last and final revelation of Allah, have accepted Allah's covenant. And it is the Muslims that are the true bearers of that covenant. And therefore, they are the ones that can legitimately and honestly and sincerely and with peace and justice uh, maintain uh, Jerusalem and Palestine for all people, for people of all religions. And so that's why uh, this, this myth that is being perpetrated needs to be exposed that uh, Palestine and Jerusalem were not promised to the Jewish people in perpetuity. It was only at that time, at the time of Musa salam, provided they fulfilled the covenant. But when they violated the covenant, then they, the promise was no longer applicable. But as we know, the Muslims did not have control of Jerusalem or Al-Quds at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So when exactly did Muslims take control of Jerusalem and how did they come about doing so? This is true. Uh, and it's a good question. I think Muslims ought to be and others should ought to be aware of this uh, issue, this historical fact. Uh, Muslims uh, took control of uh, Jerusalem and indeed of Palestine in the 15th year of the Hijra, which would correspond to approximately 638 of the Christian era. And it was at the time of the Khilafah of the second Khalifa, Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was on a campaign in the Golan Heights uh, and, and the Muslim army had besieged Jerusalem. And there was this uh, Christian uh, priest, the name was Sophronius, uh, when the Muslims had besieged uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, he insisted that he was going to hand over the keys of Jerusalem to the leader of the Muslims. So word got to Umar radiallahu anhu and of course he came from the Golan Heights and he took possession of the keys of Jerusalem and that's how Muslims took control of Jerusalem. And from that time onwards, uh, Jerusalem and Palestine had been under Muslim control, of course, there were a few uh, interruptions, uh, breaks that others were in control, but essentially Muslims had control of Jerusalem and Palestine from the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. And I want to emphasize that when Muslims were in control, they respected the uh, 
religious traditions of the Jewish people as well as the Christian people, their places of worship were never destroyed, they were not desecrated, they were extended every courtesy as befits a committed Muslim that we must always respect uh, the religious places and the religious sentiments of other people, that we cannot violate them. And so in that sense, uh, Muslims have maintained their covenant with Allah as well as with other people of the books. So since this period of the Muslims taking over control of Jerusalem and Palestine, um, have they maintained this control for this entire period? I'm afraid not. Um, although um, in the first period uh, when the Muslims uh, lost control, um, it was uh, as a result of the Crusades. And um, uh, Muslims had been administering uh, Palestine as well as Jerusalem in particular uh, in a very fair manner. In fact, when the Muslims first uh, arrived uh, in Jerusalem um, in the year 638 of the Christian era, uh, one of the conditions that the uh, Christian patriarch Sophronius had uh, said he wanted uh, within the agreement before handing over the keys of Jerusalem to the uh, leader of the Muslims, uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab anhu, the second Khalifa of the Muslims, uh, Sophronius had stipulated that Jews would not be allowed to enter uh, Jerusalem. And yet the Muslims never accepted that condition. Uh, they said, no, we are not going to uh, keep the Jews, Jewish people out. Uh, they have uh, religious places over here. And we as uh, the last bearers of Allah's message uh, would like to respect them and their uh, religious sentiments and that uh, we would uh, allow them to come into Jerusalem. So from the first time that the Muslims took possession of Jerusalem and Palestine in 638 until the year 1099, so we are talking about approximately 450 years uh, or a little more, 460 years that Muslims were in possession of Palestine and Jerusalem. Uh, Muslims maintained very cordial relations with the Jewish people, with the Christians, with others, they just didn't discriminate against anybody. They respected them. They provided them their uh, religious freedoms. Uh, they could worship at will without any restrictions from the Muslims. Uh, and so uh, when the Crusaders came, and the Crusaders, of course, uh, you know, it, it was, it's a very, very tragic uh, episode in, in uh, Muslim-Christian relations uh, because the Crusaders did really terrible things uh, when they came to Palestine and particularly to Jerusalem. So the Crusaders basically, their control of uh, Jerusalem lasted from the year 1099 to 1187, which is a total of 88 years. So it was during that period that Muslims lost control of Jerusalem and Palestine for the first time, but then in 1188 or 87, 1187, uh, the Muslims regained control and uh, took possession of uh, Palestine and Jerusalem again. How and why did the Crusades come about? I think it's a very good question and something that um, Muslims as well as others uh, should understand this properly. You see, in the year 1095 of the Christian era, uh, Europe was completely in turmoil. There were a number of um, European princes uh, that were fighting each other. Um, they were like the, the warring tribes in the Middle East today, these, these Bedouin tribes that are fighting each other and messing around. So this was the case in, in Europe about, uh, you know, just under a thousand years ago, 950 years ago. And of course, at that time, uh, the Catholic Church was uh, dominant and the Pope was at his wit's end. He couldn't figure out how he was going to overcome this problem that these Christian princes were fighting each other and dissipating their energies. So he came upon a novel idea, and that was that uh, he delivered a sermon, which is referred to as the Sermon of Claremont, in which he alleged that Christians were being persecuted in Palestine by the heathens. And of course, the heathens he was referring to as Muslims. So. And it was a complete lie, just like, you know, in 
2002 and 3, George Bush had lied that, you know, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. The same lie repeated 950 years ago by the Pope, Pope Urban II. And so he urged these Christians, he said, you noble warriors, go and protect your fellow, you know, co-religionists, the Christians who are being persecuted by the heathens in, in Palestine. So all of these Christian, you know, princes that were fighting each other, they formed an army which came to be called the Crusades, and they arrived in Palestine. And of course, once they had left Europe and they arrived in, in Palestine, they started fighting. And of course, the, the inhabitants there started defending themselves. And so what it did was that, uh, of course, the Muslims were weakened, very weakened at that time. Uh, you know, the, the, the Khilafah, which was under the Abbasid, was a nominal Khilafah. They, were, they had, didn't, didn't have any power. Other, you know, areas surrounding Palestine, people had already sort of, you know, made their own little kingdoms and fiefdoms. And so, uh, as a result of the weakening of Muslims, the Crusaders were able to take over Palestine and particularly Jerusalem in the year 1095. And uh, actually it was 1099. 1095 was the uh, Sermon of Claremont. And 1099, four years later, they were able to take over Jerusalem. Even European historians have admitted that the Crusaders perpetrated a bloodbath in Jerusalem. They massacred virtually every inhabitant, whether they were Muslims, and of course there were Jews as well living in Palestine and in Jerusalem, or Christians. In fact, the Orthodox Christians lived very happily with the Muslims. In fact, the Holy Sepulchre, the most famous church in Bethlehem, just outside Jerusalem, was fully protected by the Muslims. And this is the church where the Christians believe that the original cross on which Isa salam, was crucified is placed. And so when the crusaders arrived, and they thought, of course, these Christians would join them, but the Christians didn't. They said, why have you come here? We live peacefully with our Muslim and Jewish neighbors. Why have you people come here? So the crusaders even massacred the Christians in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's how violent and cruel they were. And the crusades, of course, continued their occupation from 1099 to the year 1187. So that's a period of 88 years. And in those 88 years, they perpetrated horrible crimes over there. So that was the background to the Crusaders taking over Palestine, and in particular, taking over Jerusalem, where they perpetrated such, such terrible crimes. So how did Muslims then reclaim Masjid al-Aqsa and Palestine after this extended period? You see, um, when Muslims uh, lost uh, Palestine to the Crusaders, um, unfortunately at that time uh, the Muslim world uh, was in turmoil. Uh, the rulers surrounding Palestine were all corrupt. Uh, they were cowards. In fact, exactly like it is today, the rulers surrounding Palestine are all cowards. They are agents of the Zionists and they are simply not interested in liberating Palestine. So at that time, uh, a person by the name of Salahuddin Ayyubi emerged, and now we are talking about the year 1187 of the Christian era. Uh, he emerged, uh, he was a Kurd, he was not even an Arab. Like, you know, today the, the, the Arabs claim that, um, oh, Palestine is, is an Arab issue. If it is, then why don't you liberate it? Uh, I'm talking about the, the Arab rulers, I'm not talking about the people. The people, of course, are, are fine. It's the rulers that are cowards and and agents of imperialism and Zionism. So Salahuddin Ayyubi emerged and in 1187, there was a famous battle that took place. In fact, that battle took place uh, on the day of the 27th of Rajab, which is the day of the Mi'raj of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Muslims, of course, were victorious and Jerusalem was liberated from the Crusaders. Uh, so it was Salahuddin Ayyubi who liberated it after it had been under the control of the Crusaders for 88 years. But as we know, Muslims lost Palestine and Jerusalem again. Um, what exactly were the circumstances under which they lost it uh, most recently, and when did this occur? Well, of course, again, um, you know, when Muslims uh, took possession of um, uh, Jerusalem and Palestine in uh, the year 1187, uh, it remained under their control, of course, under different dynasties. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, 
you know, it was Salahuddin Ayyubi who uh, liberated um, uh, Jerusalem and Masjid al-Aqsa from the clutches of the Crusaders. Uh, but then uh, his rule also with, with his death, sort of, you know, things uh, went into decline. Uh, at that time, the Abbasid uh, rulers were in uh, nominal sort of, you know, control of the Muslim world affairs. Uh, but when their um, dynasty was uh, abolished or destroyed in 1258 um, of the Christian era, which would be about uh, 70 years after the liberation of Jerusalem and Palestine from the Crusaders, then other dynasties emerged. Ultimate, ultimately, the Turks took control. Now, the Turks, um, when they uh, took control of the leadership of the Muslim world, uh, their leadership lasted until 1918. So this is the beginning of the last century of the 20th century. And they lost control. First, they, of course, lost control in Europe. Uh, in fact, the Turks had moved into Europe, deep into Europe, all the way up to the gates of Vienna. Uh, in the year 1683, they had laid siege to Vienna. But then they, they lost, they retreated. They had actually uh, gone into other parts of Europe. But gradually, in the year 1878, they lo lost uh, Eastern Europe, Romania, places like that, Bosnia, Yugoslavia, contemporary Yugoslavia, etc. Uh, Bulgaria, these areas they, were, they retreated from. And then in the year 1918, they basically lost control of the Middle East as well, their last possessions. Now, they thought that perhaps Middle East is an Islamic you know, territory that they would be able to uh, not lose that and that uh, you know, they, the Muslims would, would not, not betray them. Uh, the Muslim masses didn't betray them, but unfortunately, uh, the tribal leaders in the Arabian Peninsula and that region um, became agents of uh, British colonialism. And so they sold themselves for a few thousand British pounds sterlings and betrayed the Muslim Ummah. And that treachery is still with us. That, you know, in 1918, when the Muslims lost control of um, the, the, the Ottoman Turks, uh, the British took control of it. And then, of course, they, they handed over, uh, you know, Palestine and Jerusalem to the Zionists in 1948. Of course, November 1947, the infamous UN General Assembly Resolution, which was another stab in the back for Muslims. But uh, that's how Muslims lost uh, Jerusalem and Palestine, first to the British colonialists, and then in 1948 to the Zionist colonialists, and that's still where the situation resides, unfortunately. How exactly did the British succeed in their intrigue? Well, this is one of those um, very sad and very tragic uh, episodes in uh, contemporary Muslim history uh, that we are really plagued by opportunist uh, Muslim tribal leaders uh, that are willing to sell their souls and they're willing to sell Islam and Islam's interests for their personal gains. So uh, when the British uh, arrived uh, in the Middle East, of course this was in the early part of the 20th century, uh, they um, basically had a number of people on their payroll. One of them was uh, Sharif Hussain, who was the governor uh, of Makkah, uh, whose descendants uh, now uh, rule Jordan. Um, and, and this fellow, the current uh, king of uh, Jordan, is in fact um, his um, great-grandson. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we had this uh, thief by the name of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. Uh, they were from Najd. And what they used to do was they used to raid pilgrims, caravans, and other caravans, etc. Their plunder was their, was their lifestyle. So when the British arrived, these people all rushed to the British to become their agents. And the British told them that if you, each of them separately, like Sharif Hussain as well as Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, the British were paying them money. And they said, you rebel against the Ottoman Turks because the Ottoman Empire was established. They were in control of the whole of the Middle East and Palestine, Jerusalem, etc. So these two uh, Arabian uh, rulers, uh, Sharif Hussain and uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, both became agents of the British. They were paid by the British. This is fully documented. There is no 
you know, no exaggeration about this. And they conspired against the Muslims to destroy Muslim power so that they could become agents of the British. And then, of course, the British gave, you know, the whole of the Arabian Peninsula to Abdul Aziz ibn Saud and to Sharif Hussain ibn Ali, who was driven out because both of them wanted to claim control of the Arabian Peninsula or particularly of the Hejaz where Makkah and Medina are located. So they gave Sharif Hussain ibn Ali, not him but his sons, uh, one of them they created uh, the kingdom of Jordan where they placed one of his sons and the other was placed on the, on the throne in Syria, Faisal from here was driven out and then he was given Iraq as his kingdom. And of course there also uh, the, the Hashemite rulers were killed in 1958 when the coup occurred. But the British succeeded basically through lying to the people, to bribing the, the various tribal leaders, and of course these, these tribal leaders willingly selling their souls and Muslims and Islam's principles. And that treachery, unfortunately, that runs in their blood is still manifesting itself today in the manner in which they conduct themselves in terms of uh, betraying Muslims and the terrible things that they are doing to Muslims. So it becomes quite clear then that Muslims are facing some very serious challenges. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, Muslims have always faced uh, very serious challenges. Um, but uh, what is really crucial for Muslims to keep in mind is that um, uh, these challenges should not uh, make us despondent, that uh, we should face these challenges with courage, with fortitude, with determination, and in fact, uh, see them not as challenges, but as opportunities. Uh, because, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran in many places that he would test us, uh, you know, without uh, uh, challenges, without these tests, uh, we would not be able to fulfill our Islamic obligations properly. I mean, life is never smooth sailing. There will always be ups and downs. So the challenges that we face today are no greater than the challenges that the early Muslims faced at the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like, you know, in Makkah, Muslims were tortured. They were, uh, all kinds of terrible oppression was inflicted upon them. Uh, some were killed. Many of them were exiled. They were made homeless, penniless, driven out of their, their you know, homes and their possessions. And yet they did not give up. They continued to strive and struggle uh, ulti uh, so that ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. So the challenges that we face today are no greater than the challenges that uh, early Muslims faced. What we really need to do is to elevate our level of Iman to the same level that the early Muslims had or at least strive to, uh, towards it so that then Allah's help would be forthcoming and inshallah we will uh, gain victory. On that optimistic note, um, I think we've reached the end of our program. Brother Zafar, thank you. It's always a pleasure and we appreciate your, sh your sharing your insights with us today. It's my uh, great pleasure, but I just want to uh, quickly recap that um, uh, this year, uh, the Quds rally would take place on uh, July the 11th, but we will assemble uh, opposite the U.S. consulate uh, at 361 University Avenue. And this is because of Pan Am games and road closures, etc. So instead of marching down University Avenue from Queens Park, we will gather uh, at uh, the place opposite the U.S. consulate uh, at 2.30, and take it from there. So I hope that everybody would take note of this. To our viewers, thank you for joining us in another episode of Muslim Perspectives. We hope you found the program to be informational. We wish you a very blessed last 10 nights of Ramadan. Please join us again next week. Until then, I'm Afifa Kawaja. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ